Mr. Mort Sow, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Do It Yourself show will be here in the Sunset uh, Auditorium a week from tonight. In our wake, the Do It Yourself show is coming in, and there are going to be all kinds of booths in which you'll learn to make uh, modern coffee tables by taking doors off hinges and planing off, you know, that kind of a thing, you know, and painting them, you know, three coats of gray primer, rat gray primer, and you take the door and you put it on four bricks and make a modern coffee table out of it, you know, that kind of thing. And then if your wife doesn't like it and she likes pr French provincial, she can put it on eight bricks, you know, that kind of so, right? All right. So, uh, the do-it-yourself show will be here, and one of the you see they have a lot of booths in there, and they have like attractors for guys who want to go out and redistribute the land, you know, to the peons, and you know, kind of. So, so uh, when they uh, when they come here, they'll have all these booths, except there's certain organizations uh, that don't like you to do things for yourself, and uh, one of them is the American Medical Association, as you know. <laughs> so. Uh, they, uh, see, so they have a kind of a shocker booth, which some people think is in bad taste, uh, but I feel forced to discuss. And it's a kind of a booth on uh, artificial insemination, which I don't want you to go into at this time. And so, uh, kind of shocker, you know, so you won't go too far with this thing. I think there's been a general, you know, like, right? All right. So, anyway. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Now, we, see, I'm not geared to total acceptance, as you may have noticed. Uh, do, <laughs> Boy, I, I tell you, I was a fan for so very long, and uh, now I'm getting a chance to, uh, to work with musicians. For a long time, I was kind of a fan, and I used to read album notes. This is one of the albums. Uh, these albums come out of Southern California, and uh, they don't have any of the guys on the cover, as you know. Uh, the guys are all talked about back here, and then on the front, they have this one guy who poses for most of the albums. And he's not a musician, but he has a, a peculiar type of talent, which is in keeping uh, with jazz as a Native American art. And that is, he has acne and he's thin. You know, one of those, you know, that kind of guy? So, that kind of a guy. So, thank you. So, so that kind. So, uh, now, uh, about, the, about this jazz thing, I uh, wanted to talk about notes and why uh, some of the albums, uh, a lot of them are recording the liner notes as a speech, you know, and then writing the solos on the back. You know, it's kind of, so, uh, Dave has solved this whole thing. Now this album, which is just of this uh, concert, the one I was talking about a second ago, uh, this is a little bit different, and I think it's a true jazz album. It's more in keeping with Dave's standards that you'll see in the film a little later, called Stompin' for Mealy, which Jimmy mentioned a while back. And I think this is the only jazz album as such that ever qualified, in that every time you play it, you'll notice that the solos are different, which is kind of weird, you know? <laughs> so, it's not too easy to do, and uh, I think... Uh, there's a, there's a degree of creativity uh, which is indigenous. And, uh, or, uh, so uh, now that I've succeeded in being obscure, now I actually, uh, I threw that in for, there's a couple of guys here I noticed uh, from the Army Language School who came in here. And uh, we didn't think we'd have a house till they came in and were followed by these agents from CID. And that kind of, you know, those, those are the ones. So uh, this, uh, oh, I see. Well, this. Uh, this may have something to do uh, with radicalism, which I intend to treat later on tonight. Uh, I want to talk about this uh, because the UN has met in San Francisco. 60 member nations got together, and now we have 58 more enemies. I thought you'd like to know. So, uh, you, we up there? Oh, this is great. This is, they all met, and it's all told about here in the San Francisco Chronicle, which is uh, more, uh, more than not famed for exposing the San Francisco Police Department, as some of you know. And uh, they brought a great degree of low morale uh, in the San Francisco Police. And uh, actually, they shouldn't have. It's just that, uh, see, they thought they'd sell a lot of papers. You know, kind of, kind of a circulation giving. So the examiner got wind of it. The examiner, of course, is put out by Mr. Hirsch Jr., who's a, kind of a far-thinking guy. He's kind of an advocate, you know, of international relations and so forth. And he, uh, he decided to forget. Uh, see, he was writing a series about Russia in, this, in the examiner. And it was a kind of a, uh, well, it was taken from a speech he made in Oakland, in which he spoke uh, for four hours uh, about his two-hour trip to Russia. You know, that kind of a... <laughs> So uh, he, he dropped it. See, he noticed that the Chronicle was selling a lot of papers talking about the police. So he started to expose the Oakland police as a kind of a gimmick, you know, for circulation. And then uh, to give you an idea how hysterical this thing can get, it becomes a fad. The uh, San Francisco News went after the San Bruno police, which is a small, you know, kind of. So pretty soon, the shopping news, which is a quiet paper, you know, ordinary, you know, I kind of. They did this a terrific expose of crossing guards in front of your schools. You know those guys, the kids? They just think, you know, a wild thing. So uh, I want to talk more about uh, the police later in a particular incident we had uh, coming through Gilroy tonight. And uh, so, you know about that? You have to face Gilroy as an adult before you can progress. You know, so, you know about this stuff? So, uh, 
Well, we came through there, see, and uh, uh, Paul had the drums in the back end. He also had uh, the other act, you know, which is kind of a problem. And we had Roy Corral and, uh, and Jackie Kane, you know, who use their voices in, as instruments. And as a result, Dave said they had to ride in the instrument truck, you know, in the deck of a car. You know what kind of thing? It's kind of a jazz, kind of a purist uh, point of view he has, uh, which I want to go into a little later. It goes along with these notes. And uh, high fidelity, which I started to talk about at the beginning. I didn't want you to think that the show isn't integrated. You know what kind of a thing? So uh, I was talking about high fidelity at the beginning and contemporary people on the peninsula now uh, actually the, the high fidelity situation uh, was best uh, is best uh, uh, well the exposition is in a magazine called high fidelity magazine which some of you may have gotten and a lot of you wonder how they can go on talking about sound month after month and they have this big thing this big tome that comes out and it's all about uh, music you know so a lot of people have gone out of their skulls especially up around san francisco as you know out on high fidelity and guys are going into hawk you know the most uh, further out than with cars or anything they're just out of their minds and are getting uh, you know uh, thorin's arms and lincoln changers and this swedish cactus needle that comes from oslo you know about this the tracks double the same so getting all this and uh, trying to get a, a big sound you know when you have all these bugs who live around you especially up in marin county and i'm talking about marin when it was really marin uh, that is to say before the toll on the bridge came down and <laughs> see it came down from 40 cents to 30 cents and we started getting all kinds of people you know that kind of sort of uh well that's uh, this has to do and the reason i said that see there are degrees in our society i don't want you to think there are any snobs or anything uh, but there are degrees you may have noticed it if any of you were at the pebble beach races and you saw some of the guys who raced and wore blazers they wore blue blazers you know and they kind of like gold buttons with jewelers rouge on them and a crest up here with little ducks on it you know and a green cross for safety and then they have a kind of a mortar and pestle like you make caesar salads you know one of those real you know, and a big hubcap you know and then over the top it said the pebble beach rod gun Yachting Tennis and Discrimination Club. You know what kind of big thing? So, you know, so, well, I see. So, fine, now take their names and onward, right? So, uh, well, that's all right, uh, we'll get identity yet. So, the, uh, this fellow who lived next door to me was one of the high fidelity bugs. So he calls himself an audiophile, you know, and uh, you know, and they have license plates on the bottom of the speaker, you know, and all that kind of thing. They kind of, hey, you know, this guy. Well, kind of a weirdo, and you know, he turned. A lot of people didn't dig him because uh, he kind of bugged communal living. Like he, uh, you know, turn on the set and all the lights in the neighborhood would get dim. You know, one of those guys. <laughs> so, so he. Uh, he went on uh, to greater heights in which uh, he uh, got this large speaker and it was kind of hard to get. He wanted to get a Thorin speaker, but they're kind of expensive. They cost 750 bucks. So he decided to get the biggest speaker he could and he took his family and moved them into the garage. He was using the house as a speaker. You know, it's wires, you know, nothing all the way, you know, fantastic. So I'm gonna play some high fidelity records for you later. Actually, I'm making a dry run on the system and I have several albums from the Cook Record Company, uh, which were sent along. They thought maybe we'd chill seeing so was at several hundred people here tonight. And uh, it's a kind of a commercial thing, uh, but I think it'll broaden your vistas and have a lot of terrific sounds. Uh, most of their sounds are above music because music is retarded, as you know. And it's not, right? It's not enough to challenge your ear. You know, the weakest link, of course, being the human ear. So, uh, right? A lot of you think that's a cliche. It happens to be, you see, it's very true. So they put out uh, a lot of ever play records about 19 inch records and a, re a real terrific and they have a lot of uh, weird sounds like uh, old things like the New York Central train wreck which was a kind of a strange thing they didn't you know they didn't expect to catch it actually what they had recorded up to then were things like uh, freeway construction you know a lot of things like that but they decided to cut the New York Central train wreck which is a very odd thing this guy was running around with a Berlant on his back in those big tape a double track tape and he's running around uh, Grand Central Station in New York and he happened to catch this thing at 3 in the morning when 49 carloads of servicemen came in you know all screaming and yelling, you know, a good deal of degeneracy, you know, and so forth, and all falling out of the windows and all, and were coming home on furlough, which accounted for the enthusiasm, and uh, they crashed into the spur due to a kind of a flamboyant engineer who was sort of a native loudmouth, you know, and <laughs> he's ringing the bell, you know, and you get the whole thing in hi-fi, this is a 24-inch LP, you know, it's huge, two sides, two sides of biscuit, and you hear a lot of great stuff, you know, and you hear people screaming for a medic, and these three ambulances, which they caught, you know, coming down, and guys running out with sulfur, and a lot of doctors, and people getting injections, and yelling, you know, and where's my mother, and you know, a lot of that, you know, terrific, so, you, see, could probably accept it, because you're a very literate audience, but a lot of people, uh, get too emotional about this record, you know, uh, especially if they had relatives on the train, you know, those kind of people, those kind, those are the ones I wanted, so, now, uh, about coming down here tonight, you know, uh, on the way down, I was talking to Dave, and we were noticing as we uh, came, you know, closer and closer to Monterey and then into Carmel, that none of the people, we we're just commenting this between ourselves, uh, none of the people appeared as they did in Steinbeck's books. That's one of the things we started talking about. And, uh, 
I thought, I thought I'd tell you that. I thought maybe you'd be flattered. He writes these books. For those of you who are, not, are from the city, there are a few I know here. Uh, he writes these books about people uh, around Salinas and Monterey and so forth. And he also writes about people in the Central Valley down toward Bakersfield who are interminably exploited down there, work 12 to 14 hours a day, uh, you know, picking fruit. You know, and they work out for the United Fruit Company, a lot of small outfits like that. You know, and they go out and they pick a lot of stuff like rutabagas, you know, and uh, zucchini and uh, a lot of offbeat fruit. You know, I kind of, you know, a lot of weeks. So these, uh, these people, see, they work down there interminably, and uh, Steinbeck wrote a book about them called Sweet Thursday, which is kind of a drag all the way through, except that in the end, it has a note of hope for our generation, which proves none of us are decadent, you know, and he tells uh, all through it, you know, most modern novels are kind of a drag, you know, everybody's hacked at their mothers, you know, and there's a big scene, they hate their mother, and they hate their father, and they hate the south, and they hate the swamp, and they hate the hammock, you know, and all that, but this... <laughs> Uh, this is different, see? It has kind of a note of hope. He tells how these people are exploited, picking this, uh, two kinds of fruit here, uh, 14 hours a day, and how they're all bugged, you know, and there doesn't seem to be any future, except that, you know, after all, it, it can only last all summer, and then in September, school's open again, you know, when you come back, and it's kind of only a memory. Now, uh, the school I want to talk about is the University of California, which I'll get back to uh, in a minute, but first of all, I want to mention one other thing. The 55 Jaguars are out, and uh, Mr. Inskip is bringing them into Monterey at a limited rate, you know, because uh, there won't be any weapons of prestige in our society, you know, if everybody has one, you know, that kind of thing. And I know about these cars because I owned a 53. In fact, my first trip down the peninsula was in a 53, and uh, that was when I bypassed Gilroy. That's when I want to get back to the traffic problem in Gilroy. And these cars, as a matter of fact, are uh, probably the biggest weapon of prestige. I bought one uh, initially to impress a girl, you know, that kind of thing, and I thought I could impress her with worldly goods, but I didn't know that she was a bohemian, you know, that kind of thing, and because uh, I, uh, see, I made a mistake, I thought she was a girl, and she did, you know, kind of, right? so, uh, the car itself, uh, see, uh, the car itself uh, was actually bought by me in order to assert my masculinity, you know, that kind of thing, because I wanted to shift my own gears, you know, that kind of, it's kind of an attitude, you know, a kind of virile, and I decided uh, to uh, buy this car in order to shift my own gears and turn my own wheels, you know, and step on my own brakes. No power equipment for me, you know, kind of wild car. My feet out over the block, you know, and I really wail, and my face muscles recede in three gears, you know, and all, right? <laughs> So when I bought the car, see, I didn't know that this plan would later backfire. The car didn't have any brakes. That was a problem. So you had to go down through the gears, and it didn't have any brakes because that's a bug they worked out later. And, uh, you know, the next year is only, you know, 50, 53. So uh, the car itself, uh, you know, they gave you a letter. When you didn't have any brakes, you tried to get brakes, you tried to get parts, and they would give you a letter, see, uh, from the British Motors up in San Francisco, at which you could show the policeman if they stopped you for running into anything, you know. You could always, you know, get out there, you know, with a mallet, because you do everything yourself, you know, pound out the front end, the whole shell, and then show them the letter, and that would show that you had tried in good faith to get brake shoes, you know, and that you had, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, intent, and they say that uh, you wrote to, uh, you know, all the ports of entry, like Concord, Massachusetts, uh, Seattle, Washington, and Salinas, which is a port of entry. That's right. And it's a kind of a swing in town. I guess a lot of people don't know that about Salinas, that it's a port of entry for British motor parts. It's also kind of a strange place, like on a lot of nights when it's dark, sometimes down uh, by the, well, you can see these little guys come up in a submarine, little men get off, you know. A lot of people don't believe that, but whenever it's reported, the next day there's always a lettuce strike. You know that kind of thing? Very strange. Very strange. Radicalism. Well, so much for that. Well, the car itself... The car was an absolute, this car was a gasser all the way. Uh, I picked up the girl, I went through a series of crises. That's because I didn't understand the car. And uh, the car didn't understand me, so the car never went an economy run. It running a zinc head, you know, kind of wild. A lot of compression there. And also running six carburetors, one for, for each cylinder, you know, in the mill. And it uh, had a tendency to be out of synchronization. So I figured if I couldn't assert my virility by driving it, I might be able to fix it myself instead of going to a mechanic, you know, that kind of thing, and still be a man in the eyes of this girl. And of course, when you try overtly to do anything like this, very often it backfires. So we got out about a block and a half and the car quit. I remember this. Nothing happened and I kept, I kept boosting it. Nothing happened, you know. So I climbed out and went under the bonnet, which a lot of Americans call the hood at the time, you know, kind of thing. So an Anglophile attitude that's nurtured with ownership. And I got underneath. I got all these tools out in front of a 12-volt battery system and they're all wrapped in black velveteen. You know, it's kind of great. And good taste, you know, English good taste. And have sterling silver spanners and 13.7s. I mean, great, you know, great. Nothing fits, you know, that kind of thing. So you're very frustrated. So, uh, Great. So I got that out, and they have this instructional manual in there on the repair of carburetors by T.S. Eliot, who may be known to you. you know hey. So that's when I had the vision. You know, I started building in my mind, and his instructions were explicit enough. I mean, for a guy who's basically, you know, in the field of literature, it's just that as you uh, continue to read them, you'd lose a lot of desire to get the car fixed. You know, that kind of thing. And uh, like around 20 pages or so. 
And then after around 40 or 60 pages, you'd completely reevaluate, you know, and you'd wonder, uh, you know, uh, whether or not you wanted the car and even whether or not you wanted the girl. It's kind of a, <laughs> weird, strange, you know. So we, uh, I say, so, so. Now, thank you, friends. Uh, onward. I have a, uh, one other note. You know, uh, we're going to do a, a second part of this show. I'm going to be back in the second part. And I'm, at that time, I'm going to review this book, uh, which is a pocket edition of the Yalta Papers, which I brought with me. <laughs> great. I saw, hey, great. I saw Dulles. I also saw the Russians who were grim and foreboding, as might be predicted. And, uh, right. And uh, while I was there, you know who else spoke at the UN up in San Francisco at the Fairmont Hotel, which is a city in itself? Uh, this fella, great, went in the lobby, you know, and had these big rugs, and you can't see anything from the knee down. You know, and guys are great. So, very terrific. So this fellow uh, was speaking, a couple of Russians, and also uh, uh, Admiral Carney spoke, who has been deposed as Chief of Naval Operations, as you know, for making a speech last month in which he tried to gird us for a sneak attack, and which he said, the Chinese are going to attack Formosa on the 14th uh, of uh, April. And as you know, the 14th came, this is very embarrassing to him, and the 14th left, and they did not attack, uh, which he pointed out was typical of their sneaky fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's strange. So, uh, <laughs> excuse me. So uh, I got to thinking about that, that speech, you know, and a great deal of the citizenry and uh, how uh, orientally inscrutable things were and, you know, a lot of that, you know, worldly. And so I got this book called the Yalta Papers, which is available in Pocketbook and is endorsed by a lot of uh, its uh, terrific organizations here. And here's the uh, fly here and a title and it says the Yalta Papers and it says 20 years of treason as told to the American public by John Foster Dulles and the editors of Confidential. That's kind of awkward, you know. Right? So, a very, very political Sunday night. And then it goes on here, and there's are organizations that endorse it, like uh, the, uh, the American Medical Association and uh, the American Psychiatric Association and uh, the Dianetics Institute, you know, a lot of that. So pretty great, and a lot of that. So I think a lot of, the, see, the mental therapists, especially psychiatrists, are reevaluating because this book, you know, a lot of us, you know, you want to say, what's this guy doing talking about politics at 11 o'clock on Sunday? Well, you know, it, it's gotten into all our lives, and that's the way the psychiatrists feel, because people are broadening their scope and understanding that politics aren't just Washington's business, and that a Possibly even further, after reading the Yalta papers, a lot of the doctors have decided that mental hang-ups that were previously related to your mother, you know, some kind of, you know, she bugged you, you know, big vision, or your old man, or Oedipus, or Electra, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, may have been Roosevelt's doing all the time. I think this is, you know, right? So, uh, about so that, and then uh, one, I have one closing note for you, friends, before we spring you uh, for a while. And um, we have to go back and make more records and dub them, see? So uh, make the motions. So I uh, have about a robbery here. You know, this is graduation month. It's also, it's a getting married month for girls. Some of them will be seen working in insurance offices between graduation and marriage. There's a 40 minute interim there where they're free. And uh, so it's also graduation month and guys are going out to face the future and sitting through speeches, you know, and, and it's a, kind of a rough thing. A lot of guys probably do it in auditoriums like this. And a lot of guys don't know what to do. Some guys are wholesome and uh, some are not. Some take a very dim view and want a shortcut to a Cadillac in our society. And I have such a case here, which is on uh, page three of the newsy part of the Sunday Chronicle today. That's the only part I kept. You know, I did away with the comics and all that stuff to keep the show at a very literate level. And it tells about these fellas who were three veterans who tried to sort of maladjusted, you know, and they uh, tried to uh, rob the Fairmont Hotel, this place I was talking about a second ago. And uh, these guys are an example of bad people versus good college people, as opposed there are no grays in between here because the guy who stemmed the robbery was a good college person who was working up there and he had a PhD in English which he just got and he's working as night relief clerk at the Fairmont and he's getting you know about 95 cents an hour but it's tremendous experience and if you're a writer there's all kinds of wonderful impressions you can get there so uh, he's working there you know wearing a Zellin jacket from DuPont you know one of those terrific jackets you can rinse out and take on the next shift you know that kind of thing it's so great so you know work with the management so these fellows came in while all this UN stuff was going on uh, they came inside and they figured in all the noise, they could rob the Fairmont. And they had a fantastic plan in which, it's amazing, the lengths people go to uh, not to work in our society. They had figured out that they would rob the Fairmont and live in the hotel the rest of their lives on the money, you know, that kind of thing. So, wow. So they walked in, and uh, they're walking, you know, I had sawed off shotguns and tear gas shells here under the left arm, you know, under the sleeve. Great plan. And I walked inside, and the clerk was there, and he thought they were going to register for a room. So he put down a card, and he said, can I help you gentlemen? So they had it all figured out, you know, no noise, and don't awaken any of the guards. There's a lot of security, you know, because of the UN thing. So he took out ballpoint pens, you know, and they wrote to him on a registration instead of, you know, what they're taking, what room, and where they're from. They wrote down, this is a holdup. Give us all the money in the safe. And then said, 
direct quote. It says here, if you act normal, you won't get hurt. And he wrote that in a note and he put it underneath the cage. So he read it, and of course, being a college person, it presented a kind of a challenge to him, you know. So he thought about it, and he did, you know, he even forgot about the guns, and he turned it over and he wrote a rebuttal to them, you know, with his own pen. <laughs> so he, he wrote back and he said, uh, he said, act normal, question mark, define your terms, you know. He, so, so, odd, huh? So, uh, said, so uh, they wrote back, then they wrote back to him, and they said, you know, I didn't want to be vocal at all costs, so they'd be discovered in a robbery. So they wrote back to him, and they, they said, uh, you know, don't give us any of that jazz, you know, just get the money out of the safe. And just because you've had a college education, and we haven't enjoyed those social advantages, why, uh, you know, don't be a snob. And he gave him this note. So he read it, and he thought about it, he turned it over, and he said, it's, he wrote back to them, he said, it's not a matter of being a snob or a formal education versus growing up in a pool hall or other parts of the streets. Uh, the, the real thing is to learn to differentiate generic and relative terms, see, so that we don't rear a nation of morons, you know, and so and he handed that back to them. So they read it, and he turned it over, and he said, this is not a debating society, give us the money, you know, and they shoved it underneath. <laughs> so he read that, and then he made corrections for spelling on it, you know, like, kind of, it's really interesting. So, uh, they, you know, they waved the guns finally at him, and uh, he got kind of scared, see, being an intellectual, ergo, he was a snob, so, and also a coward, see, that's what it says, so, you know, editorializing the Chronicle. So, he gave him all the money, and he is a very intelligent guy, very cerebral, he gave him $5,000 in pennies, was in 26 sacks, and <laughs> so, they thought something was up, you know, and, uh, <laughs> he said, uh, what's up? That's a quote. So, he said, what's up? So, uh, he said, they allegedly said, what's allegedly up? That kind of a quote. So. <laughs> Freedom of the press. So they said, so uh, he said, uh, well, uh, he said, they, they, you know, they, he said, that's all I have, you know, blame it on Governor Knight, you know, that's all, that's tax money. So he gave him 26 sacks and went out and they put it in their car, which was like this, you know, uh, without benefit of torsion bar, I might add. And uh, they drove away, you know. So after they split, he ran out and called up Captain English of the police department, you know, uh, to catch these guys. And this is where the big conflict ensued because he wanted them to go right out and go after him. And English wasn't sure about this because English is kind of an avant-garde guy. You know, he used to be warden of the Preston Industrial School, you know, where the quartet got its start playing for collegiate people. Uh, yeah, that's right, not there, you know, just playing for the people. And the Preston Industrial School was kind of a, uh, well, actually, when Captain English was warden English down there, his idea was uh, to make, you know, make the kids in a good, you know, kind of like uh, considering prisoners are people. And this is very hard to do. You have to understand that uh, delinquency is not inbred, you know, and that the kids have to get rid of this nervous energy somehow. Like some of you read that up in San Leandro, which is kind of a, uh, a suburb of Oakland up there, which is kind of a redundancy uh, outside of Oakland, that a lot of kids went in last week, you read last Monday, went in four or five kids and threw eggs all over the altar of this Buddhist church they have out there, which is for students from the University of California who are going through a state of flux. So I know, I happen to know about this school because I went to, to the Whittier State School for Boys, which is the same problem. All we had down there was one social worker who was on our side. You know, kind of a scene, and she'd come in there and she'd meet us. There we were, 15 years of bitterness, you know, all piled up, you know, and she used to try to get along with us, you know, because we all went down her, and we all went down her on motorcycles. I remember this when we were interned. I got 90 days there, first time when I was 15, and we all showed up, you know, and we we're out of our heads, you know, everybody wore low Levi's, which used to drop into off a high bar, you know, those kind of guys. <laughs> uh, and, Big leather jackets, you know, multi-directional zipper jackets, you know, those kind of guys, and terrific, you know, and pretty crummy looking cats, except for great hair, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, wham, wham, whack, you know, we're very dry, dehydrated. So, uh, we, uh, when we were interned there, the social worker, who was our only friend, this girl who never married, and was going to the University of California and attending classes at UCLA so she could park, you know, that kind of thing. So, so, uh -huh. so. She used to come in, you know, every Wednesday afternoon, and her job was to understand you for an hour. You know what kind of a day? So, you know, she'd walk in, and she'd wear a leather jacket, too, you know, and, and she wouldn't take a car from the county motor pool. She'd use civil service. She'd get a motorcycle, you know, a BSA with a foot shift, you know, right of her head, and she'd come up there and try to get along with the guys who were tremendously bitter. You'll never believe it, you know, and it always, you know, like, just like nails, you know, and she'd stop him in the yard. You know, she'd pick a guy at random, you know, who looked particularly like he hadn't unclenched his fist since he was 10, you know, one of those guys who was real bitter, and, you know, they'd come running at her, and she'd put her hand on his shoulder, and she'd say, how about a Coke? You know, that kind of thing, you know, kind of warm, you know, and uh, some of the guys would say great and other guys would say, don't pity me, you know, that kind of thing, keep running, you know, so, really bitter, so, 
So this, this very social worker, as she went to the warden, and you can imagine, you know, how conservative the administration was, because we're all marching, you know, hand in hand, you know, marching, you know, terrible, you know, had tremendous in-group feeling, and we felt like the world hated us, you know, very bad. So she went to him, and uh, she said, one thing I want you to get rid of, I want you to change the food, and a lot of sadistic guards and so forth, but the big thing was this electric fence, it was about 24 feet high, this was the end, you know, it's all chicken wire, real corrugated chicken wire, and it had a kind of a four-volt charge, not enough to hurt you, uh, but it could act as a deterrent to initiative. You know, kind of <laughs> Good terms. So you'd, uh, you'd wake up, you know, in the middle of the night and there'd be, you know, maybe a guy who, uh, who you know, he's kind of bugged, you know, about his family or something and he'd be gone from the sack, you know, and then you'd see a flash or maybe you'd hear, you know, <laughs> and uh, right, and then he'd fall off the fence, you know, and he'd come in back in with crushed spirits and, uh, you know, and he'd come in, you know, and, and nothing hurt physically, but I think tremendous dampening of the spirits. And I say, you know, and they'd all come and say, hot, wow, mm. you, know, mm. you know, a lot of that. So she saw this too. And she went into the warden and she said, look here, warden, this was her last ultimatum before she resigned. And she said, uh, look here, warden, I cannot rehabilitate these young men as long as that fence is staring them in the face. And he'd say, uh, look here, Miss Benson, I cannot rehabilitate them if they're not here. And there was a lot of that. Thing. <laughs> back Isn't that wild, huh? Well, mm. so now it's going to be, uh, it's, it's almost breathing time. It's time for the, the seventh inning stretch, so to speak. It's because we all love baseball. And uh, I, I, which I want to talk about in a second. We're going to get back to that. And one, oh yeah, that's all right. All integrated program tonight. And before I, I, I uh, let you out, before we unlock the back doors there, you're kind of bottled in here. Cap, that's what they mean by the term captive audience. Uh, I wanted to make one point here. Uh, on the way down, I noticed that a lot of the motels uh, had the sign outside, and it said that they were approved, you know, by Duncan Hines and all that. And they're in the AMA, which is the American Motel Association. And they've been having kind of a hassle uh, because the Daughters of the American Revolution have been down on them. You know, it's been a lot of that. And I've been saying that, uh, you know, they're not primarily tourist accommodations, you know, and a lot of immoral things and all that kind of stuff. And uh, these people in the real estate lobby uh, don't want to be closed up, you know, because it's not really fair to uh, blanket accusation. So there's been quite a fight in the legislature, which is talked about here. In which uh, the DAR uh, proposed that the state make an ordinance that the motels hang out a neon sign that might say, uh, you know, kind of a New England attitude. If you've been back there, you'll recognize this. Very narrow-minded, sort of like, uh, you know, luggage is essential. If you don't have it, just keep going. You know, you know, you know. So, so, uh, so, something to think about. So, uh, so the real estate people, uh, you know, countered that and they sent up a lawyer who's kind of a great brain. He worked for Pacific Gas and Electric, you know, and was, <laughs> he was used to challenges, you know, one of those guys. So he, he decided to abridge the sign, you know, kind of amend it so all parties would be happy. But it confused a lot of motors who drive in the trees reading it, you know, and they'll say things, you know, like uh, luggage is essential. It'll be a big comment and say, but you can rent it inside at a nominal fee, you know. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of thing, very strange. So. Uh, about the smoking, that's up to you. I don't know if you saw Lucky's having quite a hassle with Edward R. Murrow about lung cancer. I don't know if you know about this. I don't want to deter any of you. Uh, they see there's a, a lot of there's been a lot of talk back and forth about the tests on the mice and uh, the moral question whether or not mice should smoke in the first place. <laughs> well, so, uh, wait, the challenge. So, see the the advertising people, of course, will, will always be hip. They'll always, you know, they can always stamp on, you know, you're a man or a mouse. You make up your mind. You know what you can do. You know. So, you, know, you know, it's hard enough to be one, you know, so uh, terrific. So uh, you can go out there and you can make it. I happen to have worked on the lung cancer telethon in New York last uh, Christmas when I was back there, uh, which was tremendously corrupt. It was run by some guys with no ethics. And uh, as a result, uh, <laughs> these fellows in the advertising game, and uh, as a, uh, which is a separate race. Anyway, as a result, uh, uh, as a result of this uh, telethon, we raised $300,000, which we did not know uh, would go to the tobacco company for legal aid to fight the kind of phrase. Quite a bring down, quite a bring down. So, okay, uh, we'll see you uh, in about 10 minutes. In those 10 minutes, we may see you in the back end for a cigarette. You've been real great to talk to, and uh, to prove it, we'll be back to talk to you more, okay? We'll see you next time. Thank you. Where, where, oh, I had a, a couple of interesting things happen while I was outside. I was talking to a couple of Federal Bureau of Investigation agents uh, who were covering the show. And, uh, and these fellas, are, uh, they are a part of the Campus Subversive Kit up at the University of California. And uh, they wanted to know what this meeting was for, you know, because they noticed some of the people on the other side, uh, during the, some of the more percussive effects of the quartet, were joining arms. You know that kind of thing? And uh, I think this is indicative of a philosophy that's outmoded in the United States. And these, these particular, well, these fellas 
uh, roam around the campus of the University of California and have a kit in two suitcases, see, and it has everything they need in it, like they have uh, white bucks, you know, so they can pose as students, and, uh, and, and that's all you need, and white, co and, you know, mock coffee cups, those kind of things, you know, so they can lean against corners, you know, and so forth, and uh, then they have this other suitcase with witnesses in it, that's the part. Now, <laughs> so, uh, now, I'd like a lot of you to know that probably the greatest part of the fight against subversion uh, was done by Walter Winchell, who is a philosopher from New York City. And, uh, yeah, well, everybody in New York is a philosopher. That's the home of East Coast Jazz. That's any record without Shorty Rogers on it. See, to sort of, uh, to, oh, I see, right there. Uh, see, what Winchell started this contest in order to get some of the fellas uh, who were anti-communist out on campus, because when I went to school, back around 1950 and 51, there were a lot of radicals on campus, you know, a lot of guys who were waiting for uh, the government to give them security, those kind of fellas. And uh, there's a great deal of radicalism. I remember uh, that a lot of us went into this parade in November. You remember Armistice Day? Well, that became Veterans Day by an executive order of President Eisenhower. And a lot of us were marching in the parade, you know, camaraderie, the old days, 32nd Infantry Division. We're all marching, carrying these flags. And uh, we got fouled up uh, down on Kearney Street in San Francisco and led to a good deal of bitterness, see, because our minds were, were uh, poised for this, trigger quick. See, we were in this parade, and the line of March got sort of goofed, and we wound up in a line for Christmas work at the post office. <laughs> <laughs> Very bad. So, so yeah, it can, oh, I can do it. Listen, that's... Uh, so, uh, you know, and then you get, you know, you get down by the uh, post office and, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, an awful lot of things uh, can happen to you there. I mean, if you know, you know the post office. So, uh, that's run by the fellow who used to make Chevys for General Motors. And General Motors is bringing the Motorama through Carmel next week. I thought some of you would like to know. And you have this terrific show and have a big sign that says, uh, General Motors Strikes Back. You know that kind of thing? It's a great, great exclamation. And uh, it's a terrific show. And in it, they have a demonstration of how they make Corvettes, which are American sport cars or don't turn any corners, you know, kind of a sport car. But they're made of plastic. As you know, it's very fine for roadside service. You can be fixed anywhere. And uh, they're made sort of, uh, well, they have a demonstration to make them on this belt. And you know, I have these kind of jet tube-like taillights, like an airplane, Air Force plane. And they're terrific. Uh, it shows how they make them. They get this plastic heated, about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And one fella starts to pull them, while another one drives the car the other way. You know, that kind of hot, you know, and it melts. It's very exciting. Now, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the Motorama, of course, is presided over, uh, they have pictures inside of all the fellows who went into the service, you know, uh, from General Motors. And the numbers manifest, of course, and it says, uh, our two contributions to the defense of our country. And there's a picture of, G of uh, Secretary Wilson, and then there's a picture of the V8 engine, which they gave for the M4 tank, you know, to pull the tanks, 500 horsepower, two of them. So, uh, actually, uh, that's just about the way it happened, too, chronologically. Uh, Wilson went into the Department of Defense, and then the contracts went through for the engines. <laughs> Amazing. It's, kind of, it's true. So, uh, well, I tell you, when I think about it, it's a kind of a thrill just to think about it. And uh, so, I, I want to get back to this in a second about General Motors. The reason I mentioned it was, you see, the Corvette experimental car uh, was given away by Walter Winchell in his campus subversion contest. And the idea was to bring out all the guys who weren't subversives at college to strike back. The kind of guys that believe in a free economy. The kind of guys that want to do things for themselves and aren't waiting for security and so forth. Those kind of, kind of like business administration people. You know those kind of people? Perfect. So, I was in the business administration department at that time, and I was going to ready to take my place in industry and uh, I thought maybe I'd work in an advertising agency so I had bought a charcoal gray suit which that time was quite a departure as you know and uh, because modern science was looking for a color more somber than black you know that kind of thing so why so uh, this particular suit, you see, I had, uh, you know, was, you notice all the musicians have swung over, this uh, being at the, the request of Jerry Mulligan and other instigators of the flame, and uh, it was sort of, uh, you know, like uh, four buttons, you know, at that time, most of the guys were going into four buttons because three didn't show you were really sincere, you know, you had to get four buttons and four or five vents, you know, all the way around, <laughs> and a large stick pin which seemed to go through the body, you know, like, <laughs> tie it great and huge cuff links you know and uh, made of some avant-garde material you know like you know made at home at do-it-yourself stuff again you know well well you know like uh, maybe uh, bronze alloy or copper you know some kind of a synthesis you know elk hide you know something terrific only the guys would cover them up you know they cover them up and just put regular redwood on top or something you know but underneath <laughs> It'd be a terrific, complicated system of pulleys, you know, college physics, and uh, only they keep that hidden because the public isn't ready for it yet. You know, like, <laughs> right? You can't go too far, fellas. So, 
uh, bags, right? Melody, no harmonics. So very interesting. So uh, I bought this. I bought this particular suit. I won't go uh, into the pants. That, that's a, a little later. That has to do a 1616. So you have to be very narrow. And then I got a crew cut and a pair of wrought iron glasses, which are favorite. <laughs> That's true. See, a lot of people don't know that. They think they're just horn rims. So, uh, I, was, I was in business administration, and here the contest came, and Winchell said that he'd give away a Corvette, which was the end at that time. You know, you go out of your head, you know, with a straight-up wheel, you know, and power glide pretty far out. And uh, you'd get this car if you'd write to him in 25 words or less and tell him why you were never in a communist party, which led people to all kinds of forms of inspiration, you know, especially college people. So we're all writing and writing these terrific letters, you know. And, uh, of course, a guy in political science won at the University of California, which I think is, uh, well, it's to be expected in a sense, uh, because the people in liberal arts had the creative yearning, but they didn't have enough to say. You know, I kind of think like they write, uh, oh, uh, you know, I mean, they, go, they have a lot to say, those kind of people, and uh, have a lot to say in class, but they usually don't have anything to say out of class. And I remember when I was at the university, that's true, when I was at the university, I'd always get gassed by some girl, you know, she looked like she was really terrific, great head, and she'd be sitting there and she'd challenge professors. You know, a lot of guys think that girls go to school to get married, but the ones I saw, never, you know, they're just like, 17 years old, and I'd see them risk a grade, it took them a year to build by challenging a member of the faculty, and that takes guts, you know, and we'd be sitting in some pertinent class, like a, a you know, Indian philosophy prior to 1857, you know, kinda, so... And uh, it's pretty hard to get into, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, the prophet say something and they'd say, and just why, Dr. Benson, just why? You know, very, you know, because of, and uh, he'd say, you know, uh, this is not a debating society, uh, it's the truth. And they'd say, what is truth? You know, a lot of that. <laughs> so, so, as, uh, that's right. So, <laughs> so, thank you. So, and here, the, uh, you know, you talk to them out of class, and nothing would happen. You meet these dames in the hall, you know, and uh, they'd stand there, and uh, you'd say, uh, so, what's happening, you know, or, you know, and it's nothing, you know, they just fall out. But, <laughs> see, but the people in political science never fall out. That's the thesis this evening. They never fall out. They're terrific. And they wear uh, uh, jackets in cashmere and or tweed, uh, which, uh, actually, uh, you know, whenever anything wears out, they put leather on it. It's kind of a way of life. And uh, terrific. And if you ask them what's happening, they always have something to offer. You know, let's say something, it might be, you know, pedestrian. But they give you something to take home and carve on a wall, you know? <laughs> What's happening? So they say, well, uh, power corrupts, you know, or something like that, right? <laughs> something, kind of, right? Right, so you have something to say to a girl. So uh, they, then the contest came up, and uh, Winchell started in, you know, uh, reading these letters. So about 25 million letters came in from all these college people. See, at that time, everybody was going to college, and uh, because they'd all, they were all veterans, and they had, you know, Public Law 346, and, or the GI Bill. And of course, that before that, we had the Army, which was a form of therapy used by the United States Employment Service. To <laughs> keep going on. So, you know about this? So, uh, still is, huh? nothing's changed, I know. Well, except the uh, T, oh, well, that's something else. So, anyhow, but, but they, so they got, he got all these letters, Winchell, he was going out of his head reading them, you know, and those letters were coming in, they were saying, I was never in the Communist Party because I believe in the dignity of man, or I believe in the four freedoms of the Atlantic Charter, and no totalitarian state can enslave me, going on and on, you know. So, you know, the usual stuff. So, uh, this guy at Cal won, and he wrote in, uh, terrific, you know, and he wrote in, and he uh, just spoke from the, uh, from the heart. And I think it's terrific, uh, to be honest, basically, you know, have a, a basic, like, I mean what I say, fundamentalism, you know. And he just wrote in, and he said, uh, didn't even exhaust the 25 words, which is a good case for brevity. And he said, uh, Mr. Winchell, I was never at a communist party because I've been at Cal five years now, and no one's asked me. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, you know, me. so, amazing. Then, then the biggest problem came up. How, how are you going to get hold of the guys who were in, uh, but are going underground, can't enter the contest? So it was decided uh, by Winchell and the Board of Control uh, to get uh, the other fellows. You have to get the other fellows. And the idea was uh, to bring them out from underground by uh, giving them a consolation prize for sincerity. You know, kind of thing, you know, like they made a mistake and, uh, you know, they're willing to admit it. A lot of guys, you know, during the 30s and a lot of stuff was popular, you know, in the folk songs, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, and they wanted to meet girls, you know, and all that. So, you know, you could hold them for bad taste, but not perjury. That's the thing, you know, a lot of that. So, right? So you've been there. Well, so uh, these fellows wrote in and they were to write in the Winchell and say, uh, you know, I made a mistake and I'm sorry. And then a notary public would stamp that you're sorry. See, you know, kind of like brand you there. And, uh, you know, there's some guy whose commission hadn't expired. And you'd write in, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. You know, okay, it was out of my head. You know, I was young. And then uh, he'd say you're sorry and he'd send it to Winchell and he'd read it and pass on it for sincerity and whether you meant it. And uh, with the letter, you had to include, uh, after you said you're sorry, you had to include a list of at least 200 people whom you had known at these meetings and they're telephone number and everything, see? And, uh, see, and then they'd be sorry. I think that's the point. It's kind of crazy. 
and then you get up in the morning and even the air seemed to be clearer. It's a kind, of, kind of an amazing day. It's very therapeutic. Well, now, one other point. Next Monday, uh, I just a couple of social footnotes tonight before we get into the movie. Uh, the Poetry Club uh, up at the Stanford University is going to meet on the peninsula, down on the farm as they call it. And uh, they had a little life up there last Monday when Gary Crosby, who's a budding radio star, uh, incidentally I, I'm going to be on the air with him next Wednesday uh, evening. I don't know what time they're going to play the tape, but he's a budding star up there. And he's no longer at the, at the Stanford University, possibly because television has made demands upon him, or possibly because he drove a 4.5 Ferrari through the student union. Last week, like, you know about this? So, great kid. So, so uh, that's that's another story. We're both with the Columbia Broadcasting System, a very far out organization. So, uh, anyhow, uh, Mr. Uh, see, uh, the the Stanford University has this terrific poetry club, and I was up there at their last meeting last year, and I just want to give you one note, if I could, about it, uh, because uh, these kids are terrific. Uh, I was wandering around the campus looking for life, and I was looking in and out of fraternity houses, you know, feeling nostalgic about my days at the university four years ago, and I saw all these uh, kids there, you know, running around. It wasn't much radicalism. I thought you'd be glad to know that. Uh, you know, uh, there used to be. I would see at Cal. Oh, Cal was. A lot by comparison, you know, guys are writing stuff on the size of buildings, you know, like uh, you know, Yankee go home and all this. <laughs> you know, this. Oh, so the end. Wait, just the end. So at, at uh, you know, and over nothing, you know, nothing was immune from propaganda. Young heads he used to go up in front of the bookstore with had a big sign for the paper made Capri, you know, and they used, to, they used to say bankers approve, and guys would write, I don't approve of bankers. So. Big, you know, <laughs> so life. So uh, it's kind of a wild thing. So none of this around around the Stanford University. Just a couple of guys from their fraternity houses, and uh, you know, with crew cuts and yelling at girls, riding in the boot of a '51 Chevy convertible, you know, and no one driving, you know, in the cars. <laughs> you know. And uh, you know, and guys playing ping pong, or maybe guys, you know, kind of zestful in the showers, you know, hitting each other with towels, wing, you know, a lot of that. <laughs> hey, youth, you know, and a couple of intellectuals smoking meerschaums and playing chess, you know, not addicted to the sports, and burning books in a fireplace, you know, it's kind of kind of separate group, right? So it's kind of exciting. So while I was walking around. There's this light in this building. It was about 8 o'clock at night, as I remember, and it said, The Poetry Club of Stanford University is meeting tonight, and our guest speaker, and it was a transient cardboard sign, is Truman Capote. And it's kind of trivial because uh, Capote's a big favorite of mine, and I wanted to go see him. So I could be one of the people say, You know, I was one of the few people to see him alive. You know, those kind of quotations. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, he had a big thing about his mother. He's a genuine Southern writer. He doesn't dig his mother, and he speaks for the New South and how they're solving their own problems. And a lot of people thought we'd need the National Guard to solve them, but they're solving their own problems, and if you'll keep your northern nose out of their business. You know that kind of an attitude? So, right. So, already they've ended segregation on the Supreme Court, and Tom Clark sits with the others and gets a robe. It's amazing. You know, terrific really progress. So, right. So, Capozzi is a genuine, you know, his mother bugged him a lot. That's how he became a writer. You know, a lot of you may have a hacked situation with your old lady, and you can't make anything out of it positive, you know. Well, he never got along with his mother. He used to play outside the house when he was four years old, you know, and she'd follow him down the steps, you know, and wouldn't let him cut the cord. You know, that kind of thing. Pretty dramatic. You know, and she'd follow him. And, right. And, uh, she, she would, you know, and she'd wail at him, you know, and, uh, you know, and, you know, leave me alone, you know, and, uh, and, you know, she knew he was going out the house, so she'd just try to go along with the program, you know, and, uh, she'd, she'd say, uh, well, you know, dabbing a tear away, you know, very feminine, and she'd say, have a good time, darling, and he'd say, don't tell me what to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> Amazing. So they're wild. So Capote was going to speak there, you can imagine. See, now you know the excitement that was within my breast. So I went into this building, and when I walked in, all these people are sitting there, and uh, you know, who were there for the meeting, and there's this guy from New York who's evidently like an exchange student. You know, this guy has a kind of a, a, a toast jacket from the Ivy League, and a Tattersall shirt with stakes through his clavicle. You know, they, they, that's right. That mustn't become airborne. That's very important. So uh, he's in there, and he's got a gavel, and he's yelling, you know, and uh, they're all yelling, where's Capote? Evidently, that's all he came for, you know, and uh, he's wrapping the gavel for parliamentary procedure, and he says, uh, Capote isn't here, and uh, he will be here, but that's not the point. We have a magazine to put out. See, they do have a magazine. It's kind of a magazine of obscure poetry called Wither. You know what kind of a magazine? <laughs> and it's a little green magazine, you know, with a couple of poems, and he says, I want everybody in here, if they want to keep their standing in the club, to submit at least three poems. You know, we all work together in this thing. So there was a lot of rebellion from the crowd, you know, like a brain picker, you know, a lot of this. <laughs> so, that's right, you've been in this situation. So, uh, he got pretty hacked, you know, and he said, all right, all right, I'll do it myself. You know, some men are leaders and some are followers, I'll do it myself. And a lot of people were rebellious again, yelling, unjustified egotism, you know. <laughs> right? See, this justified is the best kind. So, uh, 
so a great so as opposed so this guy kind of you know he's beginning to flip you know and he's getting pretty sore and they were, they were all yelling where's capote you know we want we, you know, like prisoners I mean like, where's capote so he got pretty sore and his kidney flipped and he said you're you all want to see capote because he's established but you won't listen to me because i'm not established that's the trouble with all of you you know you're insensitive to merit the greeks were right there's no chance for talent in this country because there are no standards i think talent is a handicap i wish i was dead the greeks are right what's the use you know he's out of his mind. So, right? <laughs> So, you know, screaming out of his mind, yelling, and he threw the gavel up, and he ran down toward the door. So I was standing by the door, because I just come in at that moment, and he's yelling, no one cares, no one listen, no one cares, you know, and running right toward me, and I didn't know what to do, because uh, I see this guy running at me, you know, here again, bitterness again, like in the last show, and uh, they sort of, you know, 20 years of bitterness running at me, you know, and what's, you know, am I going to be a social worker or not? You know, here he comes, and he's like, stomping, you know, away like mad, and he's like, right through, you know, so uh, he stopped, and I uh, told him I'd like to listen to some of his work, so he handed me a book, and then he kept running, you know, because he was pretty charged up. And he went outside, and he went to a water fountain in the hall where he had six spigots, you know, and that's in case six people are ever moved to do this at once, you know, all right, you know, kind of collective. And then he came back in, then I looked at this book, and this guy, no wonder nobody listens to stuff, pretty far out, you know, a lot of stuff like, uh, you know, uh, avant-garde words, like uh, uh, garbage, you know, and a lot of realism, and uh, perspiration, you know, and uh, starvation, you know, a lot of things you're not ready for yet. That's what I mean, you know, right? So, I thought this guy's pretty, pretty wig, you know, wig and a half. So he came back inside, and uh, meanwhile, I heard this Buick Century outside with straight pipes and a stick shift, you know. So I looked outside, his big seal on it, and said, Warner Brothers Pictures. And here comes Truman Capote, who's just figured, finished his screenplay for them, called Land of the Pharaohs, you know, which is all about Egypt, and is all about, is based on a, a very commercial book, you may have seen in the drugstores, called Moses and Monotheism. And this is, you've seen it? Very good. It's by Sigmund Freud, and tells, uh, <laughs> How about this? That's a great book. So it tells, you know, all about how religion started in Egypt, you know, and all these guys were polytheistic, see? But this one pharaoh was uh, pretty far out, you know, very avant, and he believed in one god. He was monotheistic. See, sort of like, uh, you know, polytechnical high and monotechnical, you know, <laughs> shop, right? Shop courses. So this, uh, you know, and how this guy, he uh, created the first god in Egypt, see? Because all these other guys, you know, believed in uh, gods of everything. They're very pagan in Egypt, you know? They carried rocks around their ankles, you know, little idols around their waist and their, you know, at wrist and so forth. Terrible. And they believed in everything, you know, very materialistic religion. And, uh, you know, the god of, uh, of uh, oh, potatoes and the god of rice and the god of water and the god of corn and uh, the god of the lakes and the god of stones, but mainly starches. That's what runs through it. So mainly, that's what. So, but this, you know, but this pharaoh, it tells in the book, believed in one god. And the first god, if you know your Egyptian history, was, I know that's why you're here tonight. Uh, is, uh, the, the first god was named Ratan, who was the god of furniture, of course. And I thought that this. You know, so, well, so now. So meanwhile, this is Capote's background. So Capote comes in, you know, and he's pretty quiet. He kind of like stands behind a tree until they call him out, you know. And they have two press agents there from Warner Brothers Pictures. And they say, yeah, all right, no one can talk, no interviews, no fraternizing, no autographs. He has a plane for Seattle in 15 minutes. That's all. He can read one poem. That's all. So he comes in with a big book, you know, and he starts reading poems. And uh, he read one poem, which is called Grass, which we're going to close with tonight, so that you may leave in an ethereal light after the film, of course. And uh, it's a great poem, and he read it himself. And of course, I can't imbue it with any of the virility he did, but I think it's so strong and material wise that it'll come through anyway. The indigenous strength of this poem. It's terrific the way he read, you know, he's just out of his head. And he got up and started to read, and all these people were waiting to hear him. See, there were 11 people there. And uh, <laughs> I forgot to tell you, this is. Uh, I think the enrollment there is about 12,000, 12, 13,000, you know, and they don't usually get such a big turnout unless they have a name, they told me, you know, it's kind of like, you know, great. So let's see, that's uh, in case any promoters are listening. So, great, well, uh, he uh, he got up to read, and these people were there, and everybody dug him, all 11, except this bug from New York, but he was a nonconformist anyway, you know, he was swearing, you know, and everything. So, yeah, so Capote started in, you know, and he read this poem called Grass, and it's terrific. He just opened up, you know, and he just had this big book, and just all, Grass, you know, just like that. So, kind of let it hang there like that, and, uh, this girl across the aisle from me, who is kind of, uh, she's really liberal, you know, that kind of a girl? A really liberal, and I uh, mean, you know, and liberal, and uh, grim, and uh, she's sitting next to me, and she gave me a big elbow on her ribs, so I said, what's up? And she said, she said, there's symbolism in that grass. See, and I had fun. <laughs> Wait, no, here we go. So, uh, I, I got pretty gassed, you know, so in the meanwhile, he was reading, you know, and he's saying, green grass. Blades of green grass, you know, building up here a lot of cumulative, you know, momentum. And uh, then uh, she, uh, you know, she said, he's going to build these modern rhythms. Hang on, you know, great, great, eclectic. And he's going, blades of green grass, thin blades of green grass. Then he took a deep breath. It was the funniest, you know, because we're all off balance emotionally anyway, you know. So 
he lets go, you know, with this big sledgehammer, you know, and just a, you know, just a wave, and just he just kind of like fall out, you know. He just like going, he said, long thin blades of green grass, just like that, you know. So uh, it was the funniest thing at that moment because I was in such rapport with the man. I felt uh, that he had spent himself emotionally, you know, just out. And uh, well, I know. I know it sounds funny, see, but he was kind of like, you know, there's only so much in a man. Let's put it like that. And they're right. Guts. And he fell out at that moment. He did. And he uh, was carrying along in kinetic energy, you know, and he's saying, green grass, you know, kind of out of it. You know. So these press agents were really worried, the wings, you know, and then he grass, you know, and he's out of his head and he went, ugh, and he fell out. So, so, so <laughs> excuse me. So is this exciting? So, uh, so uh, I, he, they dragged him over in the wings, these two press agents, and he didn't have an integrated program because one guy gave him a stimulant and the other gave him a sedative, you know, and, which, uh, see, which can be the end at the right kind of a party, you know, but I mean, here, wasn't indicated. So he was pretty much out of it, but it didn't matter because we were out of it too. I mean, we were uh, emotionally spent, most of us ourselves, you know, because it, oh, you only get so much of this in a capsule and you can take so much. And most of us were beginning to walk out of the room, you know, sort of, you know, so, you know you get? Oh, wow. So very powerful. So uh, this fellow from New York got up and grabbed his gavel again. He said, just a minute, you fools. He was out of his head, you know. The meeting isn't over. I have some poses of my own to read. Just a minute. Wait, you'll be in bad standing. But nobody cared, you know. Everybody's walking out. And this guy's probably... Probably a manic depressive today because of this, because everybody was walking out, no one listened to the poor guy, you know, he's screaming, wait, wait, you fools, you know, and then as a show of bravado, being only 20 years old, he opened up a book and started reading his own poems to an empty room, and I didn't get to hear him, you know, we all left, and as I walked out and the door slammed, I just heard him start something real obscure, something about, eh, weeds, you know, and he went, you know, was <laughs> amazing, uh, tremendous, so... Oh, one other thing I want to talk about, uh, for any fellows that are here from Fort Ward, as a matter of fact, because uh, they always like to talk to servicemen, seeing as I was in the 32nd Infantry Division, uh, which worked in the Allied military government in the Pacific. I know what you're going th uh, through, because uh, I was Allied military government of uh, an island named Suki Ran, which is kind of uh, Japanese, and it's near Okinawa. It's a kind of a hunk of coral out there, and I was in charge of these four natives who were out there, who had no language, and who sat in, a, in trees, literally eating leaves, you know, those kind of people, and my job was to save them from communism. And, uh, that's right. Now, now this, no, I, well, it, uh, it ain't easy, you know. Uh, actually, what we wanted to do was get them to fish, you know, get out there and get an organized society. You know, just four of them. Maybe they didn't have any drive, you know. And uh, you give them tests, you know, and you never get anywhere. You know, mental tests or the cooter interest test. That was the one. Aha. Which every one of them flunked, I might add, young man. <laughs> Shows you, don't, don't drive, don't set up. So uh, we get in the test. The idea was actually uh, to organize a society. The strongest two guys would fish. One would make the boats, and the other one would make nets to fish with. Then when they brought in a good catch, they could eat, you know, through the lean winter months. Four or five months are very lean. A lot of storms and all. They could eat, and then they, they could uh, have money when they sell a fish to the other two guys to buy a bigger boat or maybe make a payment, you know. And then, you know, move and then payments and then more boats and more fish. And... When we left that island, you know, remember they had a parade for us and everything, and we went away and we made our, our report to the Pentagon in which we showed that in 12 short months, we had showed these people how to live off each other instead of the land, which isn't easy. <laughs> and I remember this kind of inspiring in its own way. And at 30, some of you remember the 32nd Infantry Division, which is a pretty wild outfit, although General MacArthur didn't dig us. As you know, he has a leather jacket. He was in command of the Pacific at that time. He has a leather jacket with the patches of all his outfits. But of course, and no jacket is expansive enough for all his subordinate organizations at that time. So he had to screen them. And he'd only put on the ones uh, that were 65% or more and list these. He didn't want any draftees because he felt it was a low morale rate, as a matter of fact. So he would, uh, you know, just wear patches like uh, the atomic bomb unit, which used to have a question mark and a large mushroom-shaped cloud done in Angora, you know, off the end of it. <laughs> it's true. So he's terrific. So uh, he, all that, and, you know, when he used to have all these uh, terrific uh, credos, the uh, armored, for instance, the armored organization used to wear a patch. It was nothing but violence. It was so violent that guys would add new violence every month. You know, they go out of their minds, just young guys especially, and sadism would feed on sadism and would have a tank firing a charge and driving over someone's head, obviously the enemy. <laughs> You know, and the tank commander would be leaning out of the top with a bolt of lightning in one hand and a machine gun, a live machine gun firing in the other, an M3, you know, and then he'd have his shirt off. And if you look minutely with a magnifying glass, you see there are fingernail indentations in his shoulder blades. You know, a very violent patch. And you know, and he'd wear this, 
and I was saying, you know, turning. So it got so violent that a general from the Pentagon flew in. He said, you can't do this anymore uh, because a violence feeds on violence. I said before, I said, and it'll be terrible. We're going to standardize. So he said, well, how can we tell one outfit from another? So he said, you'll write credos underneath. And you won't write them in Latin. Write them in English so people will get it right away. You know, very commercial. And, you know, guys would write things like hell on wheels, the second armored, or we came to fight, which is the 48th. And in a lot of dispirited outfits like uh, the 32nd, you know, as I said, which were things like uh, the kind of thing General MacArthur disapproved of, like, uh, it's a living, you know, we're here, and, you know, so, I think, uh, yes, it is inspiring, isn't it? Okay, uh, so, it's been real good to talk to you, and uh, I understand, I guess Jimmy will be coming back now, and uh, I'm going to come out front, and we'll rub elbows, okay? Okay, we'll see you later. Thank you very much.